So John, I'm really curious. You obviously liked music growing up, but you actually started in a band. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I didn't like music growing up. I loved music growing up. Ah, fair enough. I started buying records when I was uh, five or six years old. Um, highlight of my week was my father would give me a dollar on Saturdays and I'd go to the record store. And so <clears throat> over time, I started writing music in my head. I'm not saying it was good music, but it was good enough to get a record deal when I was 16. You know, I, I wrote the music for my band, played keyboards, and we signed with a, a major independent label in Los Angeles, Original Sound Records. And may, maybe the highlight of my career, uh, American Bandstand used to have a rate of record, and they would put two kids on, they'd play a record, and they'd give it a rating. And our single got a 98, which Dick Clark said was the highest rating in the history of the show. Unfortunately, the only people who bought the record were me and my family. But uh, no, it, it was exciting because playing on the Sunset Strip in the 60s, opening for the Doors, playing with the Seeds and these other bands, Buffalo Springfield, I got a, a taste of the music life. What was it like to be a musician? I was 16 years old. I was out till 2, 3, 4 in the morning meeting the waitresses, and, and my mom was in, in Spain filming a movie, so my grandmother took care of me, which meant I was on my own. I dropped out of high school, and so I, I basically created a, a life for myself at 16 that was a rock and roll life. And what came with it were the dangers of rock and roll. Um, by the time my mom came back from filming that movie, I had hepatitis, venereal disease, I mean, you name it. I was in a hospital for six weeks, at 125 pounds. So we kind of all knew I needed to make a change in my life because as a high school dropout, a drug addict um, probably wasn't pointing in the right direction for a, a bright future. Can you think of a moment, I mean, opening for the doors at age 16 sounds pretty special. Do you remember any moments about when you did that? Sure, there was an after-hours club in Los Angeles called the Hullabaloo Club. It was a big thing. It's across sure. the street from the Palladium. And they used to have this circular stage. So one band would be on, and just as they were ending, you'd, you'd move in. So the doors played, and you know, Jim Morrison, Ray Manzarek finished. We followed, and I'll never forget, I played keyboards, and Ray Manzarek, the Doors keyboard player, was standing in the wings watching, and I go, my God, this is unbelievable. <laughs> Did that make you nervous or confident or what? Made me feel like I was on top of the world. I think you were. Yeah. And Buffalo Springfield, do you recall any of those moments? Um, just I remember us, you know, seeing Bob Dylan play. I saw the Doors play many times before the record deal, uh, the Birds, you know, David Crosby. It was exciting times in Los Angeles back then. You know, Brian Wilson, um, Mamas and the Papas. But you know, as you fast forward, I, because as I was a high school dropout, I had to go to junior college. I had to take a mm -hmm. high school equivalency exam. I started as a music major at Los Angeles City College. Right. So I, I would go to class, and in theory, I remember in my harmony class I right. got an A, and, but then I'd go in the rehearsal rooms and I'd hear the other guys playing. And I realized very quickly, this is not my future. I was not that good. They are another species. <laughs> a whole nother level, a whole nother level. Once I got, call it sober on life, I realized I gotta do something else. And I started to excel in academics. I was gonna go to UCLA, but at the last minute I decided to go to Occidental College, which mm -hmm. was a great decision. Mm -hmm. And then on to law school at UCLA. So how did you switch? How did you sort of move from music to law? What was, what was in that decision? It was almost like breaking up with a girl. Um, I stopped listening to music for two or three years Yeah, because uh, I couldn't. It was too painful. Um, and I remember when I came back to it after I graduated from law school, I had a roommate, and he was listening to a band called The Eagles, who I'd never heard of because I had dropped out of music, and that just reignited my love of music. So I spent one year at a corporate firm where I had to wear a three-piece suit, preferably gray, and a tie every day. And I remember one day I came in with a Western corduroy suit with a string tie, and I thought they were gonna throw me out of the building. They said, who let you in looking like? <laughs> so at that moment, I said, I I'm out of here. And um, I read an article about Elton John's lawyer in Time Magazine. I said, wow, this guy's a lawyer, and he just got quoted in Time Magazine? Are you kidding me? I, I can do this? So I sent my resume out and I got a job with David Braun. And at the time, 
He was the number one artist attorney, represented Neil Diamond, Bob Dylan, and George Harrison of the Beatles. So I went and I apprenticed, and I worked for Bob Dylan, Neil Diamond, and George Harrison. I met, I met Bob Dylan, you know, I spent time with George Harrison. I'm, I, this, I found my calling. Yeah, oh, that's, uh, that's really something. And had you heard of Mickey Rudin at that time? Um, I soon, Mickey Rudin and my, my past soon crossed because Mickey was always known as Frank Sinatra's attorney. Yeah. You couldn't mention Mickey without mentioning Sinatra. Same with Henry Bushkin and Johnny yeah. Carson. So when Michael Jackson hired me um, when I was 29 years old, and I soon became the guy, because Michael, when he released the Thriller album, yeah. he fired his management company, he had no PR team, he had no agent, it was Michael and me. It's kind of crazy. I'm 29 years old, and um, and he was out from under the 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 boot of his family at that point. He hired me to get independence from his father and his family. So mm -hmm. throughout my entire life, Joe Jackson and I were we, nemesis. That did not make you popular. <laughs> not did not make me pop, Mr. Popularity in the Jackson family until the end, yeah. when Joe uh, had an illness and we took care of him as part of the estate. And he and I reconciled. One of my Fondest memories is Joe put out a book of his memories, and he devoted three pages to pictures of me and Joe. Nice. nice. And what that told me, it was his way of trying to reconcile with his son, but I was the one who was standing yeah, in. Yeah, indirectly. So the music business in that day, I'm curious, when your dad gave you a, a dollar, did that get you a 45, a 33, or what? <laughs> Got you a, a 45, um, which is a small disc with a song on each side, and you'd put it on a changer. To buy an album, which cost three ninety eight at the time, I mean, that's, that, that was more like a Christmas present for me. But I'll never forget the first, first two albums, three albums I, I bought were Elvis Presley, Gold Records Volume One, The Sound of Music, and Dwayne Eddy, with million dollars worth of twang. The great thing is I ended up representing Elvis Presley Estate and I ended up representing Rodgers and Hammerstein. So it was like a, you know, dream come true. Full circle, huh? Yeah. So the music business then, what was it like? I mean, what are the big changes you've seen over your career? Primarily as an artist lawyer, I've studied the history of the music business fairly carefully. And there's been an, a complete evolution and transformation. Uh, in the early days of rock and roll, nobody thought it would last. At the William Morris Agency, they put Elvis over on the side because they, you know, they wanted Bing Crosby or the big movie stars. And artists got ripped off back in the day. Uh, it's interesting to know that the Rolling Stones do not own their early copyrights. The Beatles don't own their copyrights. Little Richard sold his, his entire catalog for a Cadillac. Um, and so the artists were ripped off. The lawyers were not important. And the evolution of the music business is one of the increasing rise of the power of the artist um, over time with lawyers like me and Alan Grubman who you know, came in and the, I came in in, the, in really in late 70s and the 80s. And it, it kind of parallels what you see in professional sports where there used to be reserve clause and artists were, yeah. were slaves to their team. Now the, the, the business has changed where the artists have the power and some of that is fueled by the ability to have a direct relationship with the fan. Mm -hmm. um, you don't even, I mean, arguably you don't need a record company. I don't believe that, but a lot of people feel that way. So with the rise of power, our artists began to own their own songs, their own mm -hmm. recordings occasionally. And, um, and so the, the power of the artist has increased dramatically. What I find interesting is you look at the early part of the music business, where artists never own their songs. So you have this inevitable rise in the power of the artist to own their own music. And what has the trend been in the last two years with Bob Dylan, Sting, Bruce Springsteen, Paul Simon? They're all selling their copyrights. But they're doing it for a different reason. They're doing it to take advantage of capital gains rates and the fact that as they mature, they only have a certain amount of time left in, in the world, so they're putting their estate plan in order. So they're cash out rather than every year getting a chunk, which is taxed ordinary. Correct. Yeah. yeah, no, so that makes a lot of sense. But it's a conscious decision. It's not they somehow lost those rights without even noticing. Correct. Yeah. The, the other trend is the effect that technology has had on the distribution of music. You know, back in the day, it was 45 RPMs, you spent a dollar, then it became an album. Then CDs were introduced, so albums that at the time were selling seven for seven ninety eight 
were selling for sixteen, seventeen, ninety-eight. So I remember during that era, where we were fortunate in the eighties to to represent not just Michael but Celine Dion, the Backstreet Boys, Carlos Santana, Supernatural, TLC, and these were mega, uh, mega, mega, mega artists that could sell twenty, thirty million copies with a release. And at seventeen ninety-eight, the money added up. So the biggest uh, chunk of, of earning came from an album. Then what happened is technology destroyed that because right. Napster, you could get music for free. That transformed into legal protection so you can get one song at a time. So it went from a single to an album back to a single. Mm -hmm. And now it's streaming. You can get all the music in the world for $10 a month. So I'd be curious if you can pick an artist who did, and I know there are many, who did get ripped off early on, but as part of your career, you were able to get that, get those rights back in some form. Well, my growing up in the 60s and being anti-government, uh, and you know, Vietnam War protest, anti-racial discrimination, anti-government, right. served me well in the music industry because I always looked at the labels as the big bad corporations yep. and I was here to protect the art. And now it's, it's changed. I think back, at the clients that I help restore fair economic uh, you know, participation with the Beach Boys when I started, they were getting 4% on 90 and 85, and by the time I was done, they had 18% on 100 on retail. Same with the doors. Um, Could you explain, when you say 4% on 90, what does that mean? That means they, they were getting paid a royalty of 4% right of 90% of the wholesale price, not the retail price, on 85% of sales. Got it. So, so by the time you multiply those out, you're getting nothing. You're getting nothing. Yeah. Um, as opposed to getting 18% on the retail price. Yeah. So I got the, the Beach Boys a fair royalty, the Doors. John Fogarty had never been paid a royalty on Creedence Clearwater. I helped him get his royalty. But maybe one of the biggest ones was Don Henley, who was one of the two key songwriters in the Eagles and he didn't own his copyrights. So his manager, Irving Azoff, called me up and he said, do you think you can get Donna's copyrights back? And so whatever I did, whatever maneuvering, Don got back you know, all those great songs that he wrote, One of These Nights, Hotel California, on uh, Desperado, so. Yeah. Does it require to get their copyrights back that it has to be a really successful artist? Because you can imagine somebody who hasn't really made it, but still there's a fair bit of money in that, but they just don't have the leverage. They don't have a chance. You need leverage in the music yeah. business. Yeah. People only and understand. People aren't really nice to each other? <sighs> no. <laughs> I'm nice to them, yeah. but you know. One of the things I tried to do in my career was build a reputation. They call it a brand now, yeah. a secondary meaning, that I was a guy that was independent. Yeah. I could not be controlled. I would never represent a record label, and I would do whatever it took to get a fair deal for my clients. So after a fair number of lawsuits, you know, we got Incubus off their label, we got Tony Braxton, Reniga, Carlos Santana's contract, we've had some pretty big litigations. I think the word went out to the labels, okay, so if Brank is involved, make sure you think about this before you, you, know, you say no. Now, I'm actually a nice guy, um, and people who know me know that I'm like a pushover, but the labels never realized that. You're a pushover provided they do what you want. <laughs> well, I think people know, you know, like Johnny Lockwood in my personal life, my kids or wife or a girlfriend I'm, I'm just you know kind of an easy mark because you know when you love somebody you love them but in business it's a different thing different story yeah. different story so take me back to the Carlos Santana story well Carlos Santana one of my favorite people of all time uh, one of the nicest pure human beings I have ever known hired me I guess in 1984 and his musical chops never went away. Anytime you would go to see Carlos Santana in, in concert, you knew you were getting the best of the best. But his recording career had, had fallen off somewhat. So uh, Chris Blackwell, the famous uh, Island Records creator, um, in, inherited Carlos's contract. So Carlos and I talked about trying to get him back with, with Clive Davis. Mm -hmm. And Clive, who ultimate integrity, said, John, I need to hear him first. So Clive went and heard Carlos. He said, oh my God, he's as good as he ever was. 
So I went to Chris Blackwell and I said, Chris, will you let Carlos off the label? And Chris is a really odd guy. You know, he lived in Jamaica. Um, he signed Bob Marley and Steve Wynn. And what label was he with at the time? Island Records. With Island. His label. Yeah. So he said, I'll, I'll tell you what, John. I'll go meet Carlos. If after the meeting he still wants to leave the label, I will let him go. So I had, he flew to San Francisco. And people in the music business don't always keep their word. Yeah. But Chris flew to San Francisco. He met with Carlos. They were gentlemen, and Chris let him go. And so I made the deal with Clive Davis. Clive went to work on an album called Supernatural, which went on to sell 25 million copies, you know, smooth and, yeah. you know, and everything. And it's the second most decorated Grammy album of all time after Thriller. Thriller won eight wow. Grammys and Supernatural won seven. And to this day, you know, Carlos, I mean, has this massive career. So in getting some of these, and say Don Henley, his, uh, his, his music back or his copyrights back, and this doesn't sound like probably what they taught you at UCLA Law School. Well, the truth is they don't really teach you much in law school, whether, no offense to Harvard or UCLA, but in the music business, it's, it's very different. Um, you know, if you're in the corporate world, as a lawyer, you have to start at the bottom and over a course of a decade, you work your way up. There's no prerequisite to have an Ivy League education to be successful in the music business. As a music lawyer, you're part business advisor, part investment banker, part therapist, part rabbi, part priest, and so you, you take on many, many roles. Um, you know, I think about as a young lawyer, I became the trustee of the Brian Wilson Trust with Brian's brother Carl to protect him from Dr. Landy. You know, that's something that a mature lawyer would never even think of doing, but you got to do stuff like that to protect your clients. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, it's, it's a varied role in the music business. And you can become successful very quickly at a young age, as long so as you vibe with the client. Right, it sounds like a personal relationship with a client is critical because then they begin to trust you well, I think I've been very fortunate when I think about representing people like Michael Jackson or Barry Gibb of the Bee Gees. Um, you know, these are legends. And, and when I was growing up listening to rock and roll music, if you told me that I could actually spend time with Mick Jagger mm -hmm. and he would give me his house in Mystique to live in for a mm -hmm. week, I'd say, how much do I have to pay? Right. I would do this right. for free, um, much less to be Michael Jackson's chief uh, business advisor. And the tests are... They're really unusual. When Michael first hired me, my first big test was whether I could get his pinball machine fixed quickly because he was having a party. I did. Right. So I, I passed that test. Yeah. You know, it's funny how people, how you see yourself and how people see you. I was talking to Barry Gibb the other day. I was talking about, you know, this is a man that have, has written the definitive songs on heartache, breakups, mm -hmm. and relationships. So I was talking about, you know, a personal thing we were discussing. And Barry said to me, John, you're the strongest person I've ever known. And I'm like, what? <laughs> here, because here I am, you know, trying to figure out what to do in my life. And, you know, you get feedback like that. And, you know, it makes you feel good. No, this is right. And this is, this is also, it's interesting because some people who are agents um, for music, for movie stars or, or others, they... Um, they feel like it's such a personal services business that they can get tired of it and then they want to go into something else. Yeah. But it sounds like if you really like these people and you can hook up with what they really need, that's, that's, what, that's what makes the difference in somebody who can really help. And also if you got the temperament for it, if you like it. Well, I think I'm a problem solver and, mm -hmm. and I like challenges, but my upbringing, my childhood, the chaos of my childhood contributes to my ability to represent artists and bands, you know, every rock and roll band on the face of the earth is a civil war zone. Yeah. And people don't realize that. Um, because in every band, you've got the person that thinks they're the business leader. And there's inevitably somebody in the band that's the artistic integrity of the band. Mm -hmm. And they often conflict. Um, every band starts out, you know, oh, we're in this together, all for one. And as soon as the success starts, they start to f fuss and fight and feud. And then you add the wives in who don't get along. And, you know, so the chaos of my childhood contributed to my... Can you say uh, a little bit more about that? Um, well, we grew up in Mount Vernon, and uh -huh. my mother uh, was a dancer. She uh -huh. won the Harvest Moon Ball, which was a big deal in the 50s, ballroom right. dancing. 
So that led to multiple appearances on the Ed Sullivan Show and dancing in Las Vegas. But it also meant that she left home when I was four or five years old. Mm -hmm. And I didn't see her for the better part of five or six years. And then my dad was working two jobs. He was a high school baseball coach uh, as well as uh, became the recreation commissioner. So I spent every weekend with my grandparents and they were a little crazy also. And by the time I moved to California, my mother was an actress and she was out on the set for months at a time. And I was sent to boarding school um, to keep me out of trouble. So, I, you know, it's like a very, I think I went to 10 different schools in 12 years. Wow. For a while I became anonymous, but, you know, going from New York to LA and not knowing anybody until I got to boarding school. And I found out that by making trouble and um, <laughs> torturing people, torturing my teachers, I could get some attention. I so. see. There's another quite famous bracket related to you. Yes, my godfather, yeah? Uncle Ralph. Yeah, my dad and my uncle were very close. They shared a bed growing up. They uh, in a family of thirteen kids, and uh, they were both outstanding world class baseball players. And Ralph, um, after spending one year at NYU, went on to sign with the Dodgers, and he won twenty one games at the age of twenty one, the youngest player in the history of baseball until Dwight Gooden. He also was the first Dodger player to welcome Jackie Robinson and embrace Jackie Robinson in, in the Dodger clubhouse. And that became a lifelong relationship. They would ride to the park together, and then Rachel Robinson of Jackie's widow picked Ralph to be one of the pallbearers. So it was a very uh, special relationship uh, that's led to me being now on the board of the Jackie Robinson Foundation, which is one of the highlights of my life. That famous number 42 is yes. also a piece of your life. Yes, it is. Ralph was number 13 and Jackie was number 42, yeah. And, uh, and Michael Jackson is sometimes even called the Jackie Robinson of the music business. Deservedly so. How so? When Michael, and, and I was there, uh, released Thriller, MTV would not play black artists. They felt that they were a network that was geared to white middle, uh, middle high school kids. And Michael created the Billie Jean video, which is one of the great videos of all time. They wouldn't play it. Walter Yetnikoff, who was the chairman of CBS Records, said, if you do not play Michael Jackson, I'm pulling every CBS artist from MTV, Billy Joel, and all these big artists. So MTV was forced to play Michael. He became the most popular video artist of all time. And MTV was on the financial rocks at that time, as I recall. Yeah, they So were. Michael actually saved, saved MTV. Them. Saved MTV, and Michael created the music video art form mm -hmm. as we know it today. Yeah. Uh, with Beat It and then with Thriller, which is the most acclaimed and most popular music video in history. Right. So, I mean, baseball is a through line. I grew up with my, my dad's uh, musical talent and my mom's athletic talent, so um, those were my two loves, sports and, and music. So, Well, you could be an observer in one and a participant in the other. Uh, absolutely. That sounds good. I'd like to jump to some of the record company moves that you made, and I guess, you know, Interscope, Rhino Records, some of the others. Could you give me a sense of, of, of your relationship to those, how you got involved? Well. I wanted to vary my career, and, and, and in addition to represent artists, represent independent labels, two ring artists, and, and then later on I became a consultant to investors in the industry. And um, Ted Field hired uh, us and me to set up Interscope Records, and, this, and then he ultimately hired Jimmy Iovine. I mean, I did not create Interscope, I only did the legal work. So we did the distribution deal for Interscope with Atlantic Records. And then I got a call from Dick Griffey, who was one of the big black entrepreneurs. And he said, Branka, look at the billboard charts and tell me what you see. And what, what I saw was uh, NWA and Dr. Dre were prominent on the charts. So he said, come on over to the studio right now and introduce you to Suge Knight and Dr. Dre. So I went over, Dr. Dre and Suge hired me. And, um, but they were tied up in a long-term contract with another label. So I said, Suge, I'm sorry, I can't get you out. And he said, and Suge said to me in his inevitable fashion, don't worry about it, I'm gonna take care of this. So he comes back a week later and said, we're free. Um, I mean, Chris, it's a famous story of the gun on the table with the guy, and you know, but I, it was not my role in that. So Suge calls up, he said, well, you do our deal with Interscope. And I said, I can't do it. And he said, why? I said, because I represent Interscope, that's a conflict of interest. 
And she said, you're the only honest lawyer I've ever met. I'm hiring you. I'm going to call Jimmy Ivan right now and tell him to waive the conflict, which he did. So we helped set up Death Row Records, which... You These know, guys are pretty good business people, huh? Uh, I mean, Dre is, is, is the superhero of modern music producers. He really created the modern producer that we see now with Pharrell and Will I Am and, and Rick Rubin. Rick, my other client, Rick Rubin. Uh, yeah, but Suge, and th that went on. Death Row became Aftermath, and not only did they so sign Dre and Snoop Dogg, but they signed 50, 50 Cent, Eminem, The Game, I mean, it, it, and that's what created Interscope Records. That's pretty remarkable. So how does, th I mean, this role of producer, I think almost didn't exist with those early artists that you were dealing with. In the early days, producers were, were important, but less so. Um, then I mean, they're the, the sound engineers, but... Sound en yeah. Then you had the singer-songwriters like Bob Dylan and James Taylor that didn't really need much in the way of production. Brian Wilson, you know, was a great producer, you know, mm -hmm. with the Beach Boys and George Martin with the Beatles. But nowadays, there are multiple producers and songwriters in every cut because the sound and the groove of the, of, the, of the music is as important as the melody. It wasn't always that way. So Dre was really the forerunner um, of that kind of producer. So he played that role. And so when you have, a, when you have an artist client, do you, do you think if they don't yet have a producer or if they have one that feels kind of wrong to you, do you recommend somebody now? We do, that's more the role of the manager, to be uh -huh. quite honest, except, you know, where I am the lawyer manager for, of the Jackson Estate or Barry Gibb, the, the yeah. BGs. Yeah, we, we make, yeah, we do make recommendations. That's mm -hmm. fair. Yeah. yeah. But there's always a tension because the artist wants you to report to them, but the manager is always the closest person to the artist, and the yeah. manager wants you to work through the manager. So it's kind of a, a, a skill that you have to feel. Um, you know, it's funny. I think back so, of so-called creative recommendations that are made, uh, just a funny story came to my mind. Um, Michael Jackson was working on the Victory album and he had a rock cut called State of Shock. And he had done the demo with Freddie Mercury of Queen. So, you know, Michael was always fake calling me, hey, Branka, uh, I, need a, I need a rock guy to sing a, a rock duet with me. I know what he was getting at because I represented the Rolling Stones and Mick Jagger. So I said, okay, Michael, how about, how about Mick Jagger? Great, Branka, can you get him on the phone? These are the two big MJs in my life, Michael Jackson and Mick Jagger. So I, I talked to Mick, they go in the studio and they cut State of Shock. And Michael, who is one of the most competitive people I've ever known, calls me up and he goes, Michael, Branka, I can't believe you recommended Mick Jagger. And I go, why, Michael? He said, because he sings flat. He can't stay on pitch. <laughs> But, you know, that was Michael. It was like yeah. he always had to one-up, right. you know. So I said, okay, Michael, I'm sure it turned out fine. But you were saying you've managed a lot of these rifts and uh, kind of a, kind of a, you see the tensions and they must get very personal and very intense. So the Beach Boys had a manager named Steve Love, who's the mm -hmm. brother of Mike Love, the lead singer. Mm -hmm. Mike's the cousin to the three Wilson brothers. And I was very young, 27, and we had this big meeting in our conference rooms, official board of directors meeting. There's lawyers, there's accountants, it's all very serious. Yeah. And the two Wilson brothers, Carl and Dennis, wanted to fire Steve Love. Al Jardine and Mike Love wanted to keep Steve Love. So the deciding vote was the genius, Brian Wilson, who the whole meeting, he's like ostensibly sleeping at the board, never looks yeah. up. So I go, Brian, you're, you're the deciding vote. Knock once if you want to keep Steve Love. Knock twice if you want to fire him. And he knocked three times. <laughs> um, and they, they, they don't teach you in law school what to do in that situation. So you got to say what you did. I said, let's, let's adjourn. <laughs> and let me go talk to everybody individually and find yeah. out what the hell's going on here. Yeah. yeah. Again, problem solving. Yeah. As opposed to just butting heads. Well, every band has conflict. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the nature of it. You're traveling in close quarters. You're, you're on the road for a year from one town to another. Uh, you're exhausted. You have wives, kids at home. You're alone, you know, whatever, drugs, alcohol. It's a lot, you know. I, I don't think anybody could fully maintain their sanity under those circumstances. So it's really no fault to the people involved. We're in Boston, you know, with Aerosmith. Um, 
you know, Stephen and Joe, who were, loved each other like brothers, but didn't always get along. And, and, and Like brothers. <laughs> like brothers. Yeah. Um, and then I forget, we were, I was doing a deal for Guitar Heroes for Aerosmith. And Stephen, who does not play guitar, he's the lead singer, called me up. And he said, I want to be the star and the center of the Guitar Heroes game. I go, okay. Then Joe called up, who is the lead guitar player, and he said, John, are you kidding me? Our lead singer doesn't even play guitar. No way you're doing a deal for Guitar Heroes with Steven Tyler as, as the star. The band ganged up on Steven and told him, Sh shut the fuck up, we're doing Guitar Heroes with Brad Whitford and, and Joe Perry. They are the guitar players, Steven, not you. And Keith and Mick were notorious. I came in as Mick's attorney. We'd sit in a meeting with Keith, you know, who the fuck is that guy? You know, it's like, you know, it was, it was always, you know, because I was Mick's guy, uh, I, I was always uh, viewed with, you know, a certain... Because you have guys like Mick in a band that want to run the business. You got guys like Keith in the band that are more concerned with the musical integrity. And any time you have two people like that, they are always going to clash. Yeah. You know, I remember one time with the Beach Boys, I was at the Greek Theater, and Mike Love is in the middle of a song, probably sing, th singing about some, you know, California girls and how wonderful life is. And Dennis Wilson, the drummer, right in the middle of the show, got up from behind the his drums, went around and punched the lead singer out on the stage while he's in the middle of the song. There's some things you just can't this solve. This is Draymond Green, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, when we, you know, it's a, it's a buzzword now to talk about IP or intellectual property. How, is that, how has that evolved, the concept of IP with music over time? Well, it's so important to an artist to own their own intellectual property, to own their songs, to own their recordings wherever possible, and their own name. And when you say own their songs, you mean the lyrics and the music, yes, as well as the actual performance that yes, them. yeah, it's so important uh, because in order to maintain your artistic vision and your artistic integrity, you need to be able to control the IP. Now, the early days of music and rock and roll. Artists did not control anything. They did not control the recordings. They did not control the songs. They, Elvis didn't write his music, you know. And, and that's, I think, one of the reasons we've been so successful with the Michael Jackson estate, in addition to him being the greatest entertainer who ever lived, is that with the work we did with Michael over the years, Michael and now the estate own his songs. They own his recording. They own his name and likeness. They own his videos. So you make decisions. When... Ownership is broken up or bifurcated. An artist has to go get permission from somebody to do what they want. Mm -hmm. It can take time. They might have a different vision. So over, over time, uh, IP has been consolidated. I think modern artists like Kanye uh, and our client Travis Scott, uh, and, you, you know, know and they point to Michael as how, as how important it is you know, to own your IP. Starting in the 60s, the importance of the songwriter be, uh, was prevalent, starting with Bob Dylan and Brian Wilson and the Beatles. And then as you get into the 70s and 80s, the importance of not just writing the songs, but owning them became increasingly clear. And so it, it's a point that's not lost on the current generation of artists. Um, so it is really important. If you look at modern songs, though, it's very odd, because Bob Dylan wrote a song, Bob Dylan wrote the song. Now you look at the hits on the charts, there might be seven different songwriters, because somebody contributes the bass line and somebody contributes the cowbell, and you know, I'm being yeah. facetious, but there are a lot of contributors nowadays. So let's talk about this role of, of trust. What is the role of trust between, uh, between a musician and a lawyer who's playing multiple roles like you are? The importance of trust between a lawyer and, and an artist is critical. So many artists have been ripped off or taken advantage of. And let's face it, most artists do not hold Ivy League degrees or you know, degrees from UCLA and USC. So they're dependent on a translator, a bridge between the business world, the financial world, and the, and the art world. And you take a pure uh, songwriter or artist, and, and their life is about creating art. They do not sit and we read the Wall Street Journal, and they're not studying with Jim Sabinius at the Harvard Business School. So it's really important to be that bridge between them and their business life, and they need to be able to trust somebody. Um, in, in my career, you know, 
I think it's safe to say I've never been the average or the run-of-the-mill lawyer. I always had an ambition to make a difference to an artist, to take their art and get them something extra for it in, in the financial or the business world. And, and even at a very young age, I never wanted to be just the guy in the back room. I wanted to be a star in my own right, even though it was a behind the scenes star. You know, I've never, I never did an interview or never did anything with the press that wasn't authorized by the artist. Of course, with the Jackson estate, I've had to. But um, I always wanted to be a star. I always, wanted, I always wanted to be that person that the artist could come to and trust. And I always, always hurt if they didn't trust me because I said, I don't understand. I'm, I, I'm here to help them. Take Brian Wilson, for example. Trust in that relationship? T tell me about that. When I first started representing Brian and the Beach Boys, the senior partner in the firm did not want to have anything to do with them. You know, he had Neil Diamond, Bob Dylan. He was the senior partner in your law firm? In my law firm, David yeah. Braun. And he was from New York. I don't even think he knew who the Beach Boys were. But when I moved to California in seventh grade and surfing was big, I idolized Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys. Yeah. So when they told me that I was going to be in a meeting with Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys, I said, holy shit, this is like incredible. But you know, I'm 26, 27, and they're legends. Now, everybody knows Brian's well-publicized uh, struggles in his personal life and overcoming alcohol and, and, you know. So building trust with Brian, you know, is a slow process of showing up and showing up. and. You know, I'm happy to say now I just did a big, big deal for Brian last year. Brian's not an e easy person to connect with because he's so far outside the normal lines of human conduct. Um, because he's a genius. I mean, there aren't many people in the history of the music business more talented than Brian Wilson. He wrote the songs, he arranged them, he sang the falsetto, he produced them. I mean, the man was an absolute certifiable genius. And with genius comes a bit of insanity, mm -hmm. uh, a bit of, I don't want to be bothered with the, the requirements of everyday life because I don't live in this world. I live in another world uh, where God speaks to me and gives me great songs like God Only Knows and, and California Girls. So I'm, I, I'm not with you guys. I'm, I'm over here. So you need to figure out a way to go from the material world to the spiritual world to speak to Brian, or even Michael or you know any, any of the great But artists. even that. Give me an example of how you did that. Well, I always had this naive view that I listened to the music of my clients so often that I kind of knew them on another level, uh -huh. even if I didn't. Mm -hmm. I've always thought I did. And, you know, growing up when I was raised by my grandparents on the weekends, my grandmother believed in flying saucers and aliens, and we used to listen to flying saucer shows every Saturday night, and then I'd go in my grandfather's room and watch The Wolfman and Bela Lugosi and Dracula. I lived in another world myself. Sounds like you lived in two worlds there. <laughs> yeah, because my everyday world with no mom and my dad not being around and a stepmother that I did not get along with wasn't a very happy place. Yeah. So to go to that music world, go to the vampire world, the flying saucer world, I could live in another world. And that's not unlike, it parallels, you know, so, someone like Brian Wilson. Uh, yeah, so so I, I viscerally, you know, understood it. And, and nothing he could say or do would be too shocking to me. Uh -huh. um, I, I, okay, I, I get it. I think I know where he's coming from. You know, more recently, we'd sit in a business meeting and Brian always kind of want to throw his weight around. So all the Beach Boys are in the conference room and I'm like the big deal. This is about four or five years ago. And I'm like the power guy in the room because I'm setting it up. And we're sitting around talking and, and all of a sudden Brian goes, hey, John, can you get me a glass of water? And like, I'm the flunky. Right. So I know what he's doing. Sure, Brian, let me get you. You want two? You want it hot? You want it cold? And I'd, because that's Brian, you know. He's just, is John my guy? Is he going to do this or is he going to tell, get it your fucking self? No, I got you the water. It was, you know, just, it's communication on a different plane. Now it's very different than, um, you know, Mick Jagger, who, yeah. one of the smartest, musicians I've ever dealt with. He studied at the London School of Economics. You have to understand, when I was in high school, I idolized Mick Jagger. I was one of the first uh, people in my age group to buy Stones records, and they weren't in release in the U.S. I knew a record store where I could get the U.K. imports. I went to see the Stones on their first tour, I think it was 1965, at the old Long Beach Arena. The place was largely empty. 
I'm a hardcore Rolling Stones fan. I idolized this man, but I knew when I was going to represent him, he just was never going to know that. I'm going to come in as the authority figure. I'm going to try to have a re repartee with him, but he's never going to know uh, how I really feel. And I'll forget, I came in one day and I had this meeting. You know, I'm thin. I got long hair. Mick looks me up and down. You're looking awfully sharp today, John. But it's like, okay, I knew I could now connect with him in the style world. Right. Not just in the legal world. Right. And then um, we went to a, I never forget, we went to a party at Mick's house. I was dating this girl named Kathy Law, who later dated Tom Freston. And she was all 5'11", maybe, maybe taller. And Mick likes tall girls. So all of a sudden, I became the, the, the dude. John, I didn't know you, you were dating her. You know I like tall. All of a sudden, Mick became the guy hustling me to find out where my supply was coming from. So we were able to connect on different levels. It was kind of similar with Don Henley one time. We were going to Bernie Taupin's wedding, you know, yep. songwriter Felton John. I was bringing Kathy to the wedding, and Henley calls me up. He says, I saw that girl you were with. You got, you got any girls you can introduce me to? So I go, this fucking guy's the rock star, and right. he's asking me to introduce him? So, you know, I always had that reputation of going out with, you know, the most beautiful women, and it obviously translated in, in the client world as well. They could connect and identify with you in ways that had nothing to do with, you know, Correct. your law degree, for example. Yeah, I mean, Michael Jackson gave me my first Rolls Royce uh, in 1985 after I bought the Beatles catalog. So here I'm a 34-year-old guy driving around in a Rolls Royce, long hair, you know, a certain amount of style and vibe that goes into that. There's some other people like, like Chris Blackwell. And tell me about Chris a little bit. Well, Chris Blackwell lived in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a famous resort there. And uh, he discovered U2 and Steve Winwood and um, Bob Marley and the Whalers. So, but he was a different kind of guy, you know. He's English, but you were Jamaican, and he had style, and he, you know, he was not your hardcore businessman. There were a lot of legends in our business, like Ahmed Erdogan and Walter Yetnikoff and Mo Austin and Barry Gordy, and they all, and Clive Davis, they all had different styles. And, and I was fortunate as a young lawyer, you know, to deal with Jerry Weintraub, you know, uh -huh. guy who had promoted Elvis Presley and, um, and brought Led Zeppelin to America, you know, Irving Azoff and Mo Austin. So to learn from these people and you, you take a little bit from each one or it's almost like being an actor, like today I'll be Ahmed Erdogan or tomorrow I'm going to be Jerry Weintraub. And you, you try it out to see what works for you. What Yetnikov stuff probably didn't work. <laughs> With Walter, I learned how to speak Yiddish, yeah. <laughs> and I'm I'm a Catholic from Mount Vernon, you know. But uh, it helped in in a in a business that was dominated by um, uh, Jewish people to to learn some uh, some some choice Yiddish. Yes. So say I'm at Erdogan. What did you learn from him? He I found him a little bit intimidating and off putting. There was such a generation gap, but he you know he's married to. A, Mika Erdogan, one of the great interior decorators, and, you know, he uh, built this legendary Atlantic Records. I, I never connected with him quite as much as I could with Walter Yetnikoff and Mo Austin, who were much more approachable. So you had a long relationship with Enrique. Yeah, I started representing Enrique, I believe he was 16 years old at the time. What was he like then? Well, of course, everybody knows his dad, Julio Iglesias. Yeah. And I got a call from an executive at Sony saying, I want you to do me a favor, but you're going to thank me someday. I said, what's that? I want you to and represent Julio's son. I kind of rolled my eyes. I said, oh, God, why not Julio? So she introduces me to Enrique, very bright. Enrique Iglesias is very bright, very ambitious. We did a three-album deal for him with Fonovisa, and the first album sold millions of copies, and it becomes this huge... Uh, pop star and still is to this day. I was fired once by Enrique and he calls me up and it took him a half an hour. He goes, you know, John, we're kind of like in a marriage. Sometimes people in a marriage, they need a separation, they need a divorce. Now, you're richer than your clients and so maybe you don't spend as much time on me as you should and I just think maybe it's kind of time for me to try something else and no effect I mean it was like this long I said Enrique what are you firing me yeah. 
And he fired me, and he came back a year later, and he, John, I'm so sorry. I, you know, I made a mistake. Enrique, it's fine. We all make mistakes. Yeah. And we're still together, you know. Enrique's a wonderful, wonderful guy. Yeah. So how long have you represented Travis Scott? Well, my partner David Burns and David Lanty and I, we began representing Travis two or three years ago. Well, in, you know, it's funny. When, when we got a call about representing Travis Scott, I had to go to my teenage sons. I go... What do you think? Should I represent Travis Scott? Oh my God, can we meet him? Oh my <laughs> God, you're going to represent Travis? I mean, it was like, okay, all right. Um, and um, Travis, you know, very bright, bright, bright guy. And he studied Beyonce, who's also from Houston. He studied Michael Jackson. So he wanted the technology and the know-how of the people that help support and take care of the business for Beyonce and Michael Jackson. So that's what we gave him because my partner, David Landy, represents Beyonce. I represent Michael. And, uh, you know, we're really proud of the work we've done with Travis. So how did, it sounds like he had great taste and he knew what he needed yeah. and he found it. He's had a way of creating things for himself that other people are unable to do. And it's a business genius that Travis Scott has. He did that McDonald's Happy Meal. Um, he did uh, a social media game where, you know, he was selling uh, tchotchkes on social media and making tens of millions of dollars. He always comes up with brilliant ideas. If, if you look back over, over your clients, um, first of all, You've had over 30 of your clients who are now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and I'm Correct. guessing there will be more. In theory, you were doing something for them, but I bet you were learning from them as well. Yeah, I was having dinner with Helen Mirren one night, and she asked me who my mentors were. And I answered in the moment, you know, Jerry Weintraub or Irving Azoff or Mickey Rudin, people I'd learned from. But the next day I realized, no, my mentors were the clients I represented. Mick Jagger, Michael Jackson, Barry Gibb, Carlos Santana, Don Henley, Barry Gordy for sure, uh, Jimmy Iovine, because you learn from representing them. They invite you into their business world. Mm -hmm. You learn what their business is and how it's run and how it should be run. It's a wealth of knowledge. Give me an example. Say, say start with Mick Jagger. I started representing the Stones in around 1983 and they were already the world's greatest rock and roll band. Then when we were going to set up the Steel Wheels tour and, and the new record deal, we basically structured a way to tour that really hadn't been prevalent before where rather than having local promoters or having somebody handle the licensing, we put it all under one umbrella. So the ticket sales, the promotion of the album, the concert promotion were all handled under an umbrella company. And that's very common today was the foundation for, for Live Nation. The Rolling Stones were the pinnacle of a touring act. You had a dust up at one point with Richard Branson and uh, where he did not like you. And then eventually you helped him, if I remember right. Tell me about that. Well, Richard Branson was a client of our firm. We represented Virgin Films. And Richard Branson came to me because he had sort of, you know, Phil Collins was signed for one territory and Mike Oldfield's Tubular Bells was signed for another, but he didn't really have a worldwide record company. We'd have the meetings at the pool at the Sunset Marquee and Richard would have these scraps of paper in his notebook where his ideas were written down, but there was nothing, no overarching plan. And um, I'll just never forget it. I said, this guy's one of the most brilliant guys in the world, but it's all done and, you know, notes here and pens there and so what what happened was when I was trying to buy the Beatles catalog for Michael Jackson ATV music I got a call from Richard one day and he said John I'm, I'm thinking of buying ATV music the Beatles catalog and I was sitting in the Concord lounge on the way to fly to London with a power of attorney to sign the deal for Michael and I could not allow it to get derailed and Richard was about to go on one of those balloon flights he took over the Atlantic. His balloon was going to take off. I knew he'd be out of touch for 24, 48 hours. So I said, you know, Richard, you might want to think about that. Why? I said, well, first of all, you're going to have to deal with Yoko. No, that's going to be not going to be easy. And then you got to deal with McCartney. I hear there's some problems in the company. And so he said, okay, let me think about it while I go up in the balloon. Meanwhile, I go to London on the Concord. I sign the deal. 
And then the balloon crashed and they rescued him and he called up and he said, what is it they say about you music lawyers in America? Prick or, you know, it was something like that. He was not very happy. But it all is well that ends well because he was building Virgin Records, signed Jan, he wanted to sign the Rolling Stones and I was their lawyer. So we, we negotiated the deal, the three album deal between the Rolling Stones and Virgin. And we had a big celebratory dinner, you know, with Mick and Keith and Richard and myself. But I didn't get to sit at the table with Richard and Mick. I got to sit at the table with Keith and, you know, somebody yeah. else. Who, who else would be on that list that you think of as, as yes, it was a two-way street. You helped them, but they taught you something interesting. Um, well, Michael, I mean, Michael had a way of getting the best out of everybody. You look, with all due respect to Quincy Jones, who's a brilliant producer, Never was his work any better than the work he collaborated on with Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. You look at the managers who represented Michael, Fred DeMann, Juan Weister, very good managers. Freddie went on to manage Madonna. Never better than when they were with Michael. So Michael had a way of getting the best out of people. He had that talent. You know, another person that you've mentioned a bunch of times, you know, with a lot of affection is Barry Gordy. Yes. And what's the story? How, when did you first meet him? And then that was a rich, ongoing relationship. Uh, you talk about a mentor. I think Barry Gordy is the ultimate mentor in the music industry. Uh, I think he was the most successful spotter and developer of talent that this world has ever seen. And you think about Motown Records and the artists that he developed. You have Diana Ross and the Supremes. Lionel Richie, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, The Temptations, The Four Tops, The Jackson Five, Gladys Knight, and it goes on and on and on. And Barry Gordy had the philosophies that were the genesis of Michael's philosophies because talking to Michael is almost like hearing an echo from Barry because Barry had all of these rules, you know, the assembly line in Detroit of turning out great music. So... I met Barry in representing Michael on, on Motown 25. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Michael had told me to tell Barry that he wouldn't be allowed. Michael would perform Billie Jean on Motown 25, but Barry was not allowed to record it. So it was not going to be on TV or recorded. Of course, Barry went straight to Michael, went right around. Oh, I can't believe Mike Branca said that. Oh, my, you know. So, of course, they recorded it, and thank God they did. It's, rivals the Beatles on Ed Sullivan and Elvis is the most famous music event in, in history. But B B Barry had all of these uh, expressions. And so when Barry wanted to sell the Joe Bet catalog, which contained every song recorded on Motown, every single song by the artists I just mentioned, I mean the finest catalog that has ever existed, um, we'd have our meetings and he'd always start, everybody would all get all complicated and he'd go, Keep it simple. We're going to keep it simple. So tell me, what are we doing? How we're doing it? You don't want to be complicated. And it was like a real lesson because, like everybody, gets lost in the details. Yeah. But the truth is, in the end, it's simple. Mm -hmm. We're going to go from A to B, and we're going to do this. Now we'll get it complicated later on. So Barry, you know, Barry's been a been a great, a great, great mentor. So you, you met him in conjunction with Michael. Yes. And then did you help him sell the Motown catalog? So, yeah, I was able to help him um, sell the entire body of songs recorded on Motown Records. It's the finest collection of music ever accumulated. But the thing that I loved about Barry in the end, when everything was done, all the commercial yeah. terms were set, he would not close the deal. The most important thing was we write in a protection for his legacy on how the songs could or could not be licensed insofar as they reflected on his legacy and the legacy of Diana Ross. Um, and, and that required me to sit in a room with, he, with himself and, and Marty Bandier. And we, we ran up against that legacy language when we were creating the MJ play because we had to convince Barry that the MJ play did not fall under the prescriptions of the language I had drafted in the sale of the Joe Beck catalog. We had to use words like whether Barry was a substantial character um, and in the production whether it reflected neg negatively on his reputation. And um, when you write the language, you have an extra level of understanding it. 
Yeah. So you could write it and you know how to how, how to navigate how to enforce it. it. Yeah. yeah. So it's more than just a one of those standard non disparagement clauses, right. but it's uh, it really goes beyond that. Yeah. With artists who have passed on, whose whose catalogs or and whose masters are, are really worth a lot, um, there's no protection for anything about what people might say. There's a fundamental unfairness and, and in real loophole in the American um, jurisprudence um, because uh, the libel and defamation laws do not protect the deceased. The moment you pass away, anybody can say anything about you and there's no pr protection, even if it's knowingly false. And, and it, it really is unfair. Uh, in my opinion, there should be protection for the deceased, at least for a period of time. You know, whether you say five years, 10 years, 20 years, however long it should be. And the most clear example of that, in my opinion, is Leaving Neverland. Because we know the statements that were made by these people in Leaving Neverland were false. Mm -hmm. They're just not true. But the media, for whatever reason, the legacy media do not have the resources or the wherewithal to do the kind of investigation they might have once have done. And then on top of that, media is a business. So it's clear to us that the corporations that own the media make more money and get more eyeballs and sell more papers by saying negative things about someone like Michael Jackson than they do about saying positive things. And taking somebody down from a pedestal is always good business. Yeah. So it's, it's fundamentally unfair. Um, we look forward to the opportunity with the biopic we're creating about Michael Jackson to reveal to the world the true Michael Jackson and not this fiction that was created in Leaving Neverland, who my partner John McClain refers to as an infomercial for a failed lawsuit. Because <laughs> the, the, the people who talk in that documentary tried to sue the estate for money and they got thrown out. You know, somehow you're this point of commonality across all of these acts. Those 30 plus who were in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and plenty of others who were household names but, you know, aren't quite there yet. You started as a 27-year-old lawyer in this business, and how did you become, did you end up as kind of the hub of uh, so many different people? Now, obviously part of it was having Michael as an early client, but what, what guided your, how did you think about who to take on, how to, how to act? Because something was attractive to a lot of different people. Well, I always tried to take a long-term view and vision. Mm -hmm. I never tried to make any short-term decisions. So I always tried um, to look down the road mm -hmm. and, and not, not a momentary um, concern. And, um, of course, you take on the clients that um, were significant clients. And I took gambles and bets on some clients. Some panned out, some didn't, based on my own taste. Um, but there was always a drive to represent the great and the talented artists. That was always- but Mostly the, that's who you were aiming for. Yeah. I was always more interested in clients to whom I could add value. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, some legal services are fungible, they're commodities, there's no yeah. big deal. Uh, I always wanted to take on the clients where I could add something. Mm -hmm. um, that, that was important. And I always had a rule that I was gonna work behind the scenes. I never gave an interview about an artist unless they gave permission first. Mm -hmm. Now the whole world's changed. Back then, being discreet and private were valued. Mm -hmm. Now, in a social media world, th th those rules have been flipped. But I still try. I still take the same position. I, I don't talk about an artist or a client unless they authorize it. You know, the exception has been the Michael Jackson estate, because our, our beloved Michael is no longer with us, and somebody does need to speak up for him, which is why. I did Pierce Morgan or I did 60 Minutes because I felt his message needed to be delivered to the world. So backstage as opposed to front stage and only front stage when it either mattered and was authorized, but it would add to the client. Correct. You weren't piggybacking on their fame to build yours. No. The other arc that I think is, is intriguing is as you've managed the Jackson estate, the most recent, um, the most recent piece is, uh, or the most recent sort of manifestation is, uh, you know, MJ the musical, which is just doing incredibly well on Broadway, and you had more than a contractual role in that. It sounds like you were pretty central to that. Well, we're we're so proud of that play. Um, uh, Christopher Wilden, the director, Lynn Nottage, uh, Leah Volick, uh, Miles Frost, Tavon. 
Um, everybody in, 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 in that play is supremely talented and has made a contribution all to the sound designers. The band, it's the best band on Broadway. But what's really the most exciting about it is it really does give a fair and an accurate view of who Michael Jackson was as an artist. And we've all been incredibly pleased at the reception it's gotten. Let's face it, there were the woke critics at certain publications that felt that Michael Jackson was not entitled to be on Broadway, and I'm being serious about that. But the truth is the critics are irrelevant. If you deliver something really good about somebody really compelling who the world is interested in, nobody listens to the critics. And so I'm pleased to say that we have sold out every show since the Tony Awards were averaging over 100% capacity for the show to standing ovations. And it is one of the most exciting and beloved shows on Broadway. So putting that together, I mean, all of these extraordinary, uh, the extraordinary talent that was assembled, you had a significant hand in putting those people together, yes? Well, I mean, I'll give all due credit um, and respect to Chris Wilden, Lynn Nottage, Leah Volick. But yes, we, we can't do a play like that without myself and Karen Langford being very involved to make sure Michael is fairly uh, depicted. And yes, uh, sat in every script meeting, every, every review of the table reads, very important to us that, it, that everybody got it right. Ultimately, the credit goes to Lynn, Chris, Leah, and the performers. But one sets in motion these things. And the reason I asked you this is if I go back to the 15 or 16 year old John Branca, there's a kid with a band who's doing amazing things, never thought that you could do it, opening for these remarkable acts or uh, you know going along with it. And your vision was, I'm an artist. And then all of, then it became clear maybe that wasn't the way to go. But community college, Occidental, UCLA Law School, law firm pretty quick on this one and now it seems like you're playing in the art world again <laughs> well I, I also had a, there was another element to my education my mother was a singer and a dancer and while she was traveling the country appearing in shows and on stage she would come back and visit new york and she took me to a number of broadway musicals including the sound of music with mary martin camelot with richard burton and a num madeline Mach, a number of others so through her love of Broadway and musicals, I, I acquired a love of Broadway musicals. So that's a central recollection of your mom that you've got. Absolutely. Is that her taking you around, and then of course she was dancing in some of these. And My mom appeared in The Sound of Music playing the Countess. I have this wonderful picture of her and I uh, at one of the performances. Um, so, you know, musical theater was in my blood as a kid. And um, uh, it... Um, so when it came time to do a Broadway play, I, I had a number of ideas of what I thought needed to be in this musical. And fortunately, talking to Leah and Lynn and Chris, they agreed and they, they are in the show. And you had been with Michael very closely for a very long time. And you admired him enormously. And so you could help guide what's Michael and what's not Michael. Correct, keep the authenticity. In a way that they couldn't. Correct, because they didn't know him. And also, John McClain and I, as co-executors, both knew Michael, so we're informed by who Michael was, the many, many, many hours spending with Michael and understanding his view of the world and art. I mean, we're not Michael, we could never be Michael, but we can help carry on his vision and his legacy to the extent we knew it and understood it and adapt it to current, yeah. current and day. John McClain, was, who's a co-executor with you of the Jackson Estate, he was a kid growing up with Michael, is that right? Yeah, he was uh, one of his best friends as Michael's older brother, Jackie Jackson. So he was a frequent visitor to the Jackson, Jackson health household. And then his career went where? To the record companies? He went John, to Atlantic or? Yes, John was at A&M Records A &M and, and signed Janet Jackson and, and introduced her to Jimmy Jam and Terry who were uh, responsible for her greatest success. And then he went to Interscope and introduced Dr. Dre and Suge to Jimmy, which yeah. and that, as I mentioned before, I helped get that deal done. Yeah, there's this arc that starts with you're going to uh, musicals and then we're at MJ, but in the interim, well, it was funny. Michael always wanted to build the biggest publishing company in the world. 
And one of the things he wanted to buy was Lieber and Stoller. I ended up representing Lieber and Stoller, who wrote almost 30 Elvis songs. And I sold that catalog to Sony. But then in representing Sony and helping them buy EMI, we created the biggest music publisher in history, which fulfilled one of Michael's dreams when we did this in the estate. Then the other thing is when when the Rogers and Hammerstein organization wanted to sell the their company and it owned Sound of Music and Carousel and Oklahoma and all the sheet music. Um, I was bidding against some of the big big boys like Goldman Sachs and others who wanted to represent them in the sale. So I'll never forget meeting with a, a Mary Rogers and Alice Alice Hammerstein, and I made my pitch of why I should represent a Rogers and Hammerstein. I went over the financials and the numbers, but then my secret weapon, as I said, and my mother played the Countess in The Sound of Music. Oh, my. <laughs> that was the, the clincher. They hired me over Goldman Sachs and others. Um, let's jump to a couple other pieces. Um, so really jumping from, from musical artists, you got involved with Mike Tyson. Yeah, after, after the controversy with uh, Vander Holifield, uh, Irving Azoff and Jeff Wald introduced me to Mike. And we met, and he says, he called me Bronco initially. Bronco, can you solve my problem with Don King? He said, because if you can't do it, I'll handle it my way. And I said, no, Mike, you don't need to do anything. We'll take care of it. So the first things we did was uh, get him out of the contract with Don King, uh, deal with the fact that he had been kind of screwed over by the law firm that represented Don King, settled all that out. We did the Showtime deal. Uh, got him relicensed in Nevada and, you know, sort of got him back fighting. Cool. I found Mike Tyson to be an incredibly intelligent, thoughtful, and even gentle person. Mm -hmm. Some other places where you've, uh, or, where you've dealt, Fred Durst, how did that come about? Oh, my man, Fred, um, good man, Limp Biscuit, Fred, um, a, a very intense um, guy, but I find him to be very respectful, and it's an honor to represent him. He's such a good guy. Where'd you meet him? Uh, my friend Jordan Scherer um, uh -huh. uh, introduced me, and um, if I recall, Fred's attorney that he had at the time was wearing a really ugly bow tie at a party, and Fred said, I can't have that guy represent me anymore, and, and, and he said, <laughs> I, I want Branca. I, I don't wear bow ties. I don't either, and I'm a Harvard professor. <laughs> yeah. Fred is his own manager. He manages himself. So with uh, my partner, Mitch Tenzer and, and Irina, you know, we try to take care of the business for him so he doesn't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. you know. Is he easygoing? Is he tough? Is he... He's intense. He's not yeah. easygoing. Intense. No. Yeah. And certainly, certainly performing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a great performer. Yeah. But he's still around. He's got staying power. What is, why is that? Well, he's a great artist and a great performer. And he's beloved all over the world, not just the United States. Um, so great artists never really go away. They, they, they might be cyclical. And there's a lot of nostalgia for the great artists, you know, so, and Fred's one of them. Going back to the, you know, 80s and 90s, the Backstreet Boys, how'd you meet them? Well, the Backstreet Boys, one of my favorite groups of all time. Um, they, were, they were managed by Jeff Quatnitz and Michael Green at the firm. And they were signed to uh, Jive, Jive Records, and that gave them Jive Accountings, not mm -hmm. to use a play on words. And they had sold, I don't know, 40 or 50 million albums and been, hardly been paid any money. So they, they brought me in. Um, they referred to me the, as the Babe Ruth of their team. They were big baseball fans. So we came in, and we had to shake things up and, and, um, and, and get them paid. And I remember Clive Calder was in the process of selling his label to BMG for quite a bit of money, $2.7 billion. So we had to create a ruckus to make it difficult to get the sale closed until the Backstreet Boys were paid. So we were able to get them a check for $75 million, which at the time seemed like a pretty good payday. Even now? Yeah. It's not terrible. Yeah. But that was, so there was a big deal that was ongoing, and you could put enough of a roadblock in place or a delay in place that it was worth compensating them, at least somewhat fairly. Yes, for, and I'll never forget Clive Calder, who is my friend, referred to it as the heist. The heist. That we went in and hijacked his deal to get our client money, but uh -huh. that's what we do. Yep, as necessary. Yeah. When they did get paid, um, what, were, what was their reaction when you talked to them about it? I mean, of course they were, I'm sure, pleased. Well, I mean, it's a great band, and like we talked about with Fred Durst, 
great artists don't go away, and the Backstreet Boys are having a resurgence right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to see them in Las Vegas uh, just a couple years ago. They're touring the world, making new music. Um, it's you know it's one of those great bands. So, you know, if you trace the boy bands, you know, back to the early days of Jackson Five, might have been the great, the first great boy band. And you you know you had New Kids in the Block, a new edition of the Jackson Five. You know, Backstreet Boys in sync now straight through to BTS. There's always a market for great boy bands. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they grow into great male bands. Yeah. Would you say streaming has helped them or hurt them? I think ultimately streaming helps. It, it brings music to a greater group of people. I mean, it's always more comforting to sell an album for seventeen ninety eight and get paid on it, right? Of course right. that's... And if if it's Thriller, it's a hundred million albums. If it's Saturday Night Fever, you know, yeah, uh, Supernatural. But streaming, I think, is democratizing the process where more people have access to more music, and then the streaming revenues have started to catch up to where the the sale revenues were many years ago. Yeah. So back to producers, Rick Rubin. What's your history with Rick? Rick is one of the brightest guys in the music business. He's a real a visionary. Um, Rick founded Def Jam Records out of his NYU dorm room, which is pretty remarkable. And with all the success he had at Def Jam with LL Cool J and the Beastie Boys and Run DMC, he then decided to go in the rock music business and form American Recordings and sign the Black Crows and Slayer and Danzig and some other bands. And then he branched out to become not just a, a producer, and he's produced a widely eclectic um, group of artists over the years, but he's also become somewhat of a spokesperson and, and a visionary in our business. Uh, very, very, very impressive guy. And where'd you meet him? It was interesting. There was a time when um, David Geffen and I had a somewhat well-publicized feud. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a number of artists hired me because they wanted a person who could stand up to David Geffen. There weren't many people willing to do that. so. Don Henley hired me, Robbie Robertson hired me, Aerosmith hired me, and then Rick Rubin hired me, all of whom wanted to leave Geffen Records, mm -hmm. and all of whom did leave Geffen Records. So with Rick Rubin, I was able to, to extricate him from his deal with Geffen Records. We made a deal at Warner Records um, for him to have his label there. But I was introduced by the manager of the Black Crows, Pete Angelis. Um, Black Crows was an artist I took a gamble on. I, I took them on before their record was released because I thought their music was great, and they turned out to be a big, big artist. And they were signed to Rick Rubin's label. So as only can happen in the music business, the Black Crows wanted me to represent their label, <laughs> Rick Rubin, and, that, and that's how I, I met Rick. I see. So it was and, and, I've, and I've represented him now for, I don't know, 30 years. So. Uh-huh. And he, he's, he's somebody that everybody seeks their advice. Yeah. But... You, he rep you represent him. What's he like? I mean, very opinionated. Yeah. Um, his Some people deserve to be opinionated. Yeah, and he's one. And his opinions might not reflect everybody else's opinion, but you know, with Rick, you're really going to get what he believes. Mm -hmm. Rick is a very spiritual guy, but when it's time to pay attention to business, he's all business. And I've learned from Rick that if you believe in yourself, and you believe in what you're saying and your mission, it's very powerful. So it's not about what the dollars and cents are. It's not about other people's perception. It's about believing in yourself. So was it, I want to go back for a moment because David Geffen can be famously difficult um, in a lot of different contexts. I mean, famously successful and as well. How did you extricate different people from him? Or was there a common theme or how, how did that work? Well, in Don Henley's case, Don just wanted he and the Eagles to be off of Geffen Records. So we used the seven-year statute to terminate his contract. We terminated the contract. Um, there was a lawsuit. And with Irving Azoff, you know, who's the manager, the Eagles delivered uh, an album called When Hell Freezes Over as a, <laughs> as a compromise. Right. It was a live album that allowed them to leave the label. Uh-huh. So there was something of a payment, 
it was somewhat early, but in the shadow of, it's like when somebody's going to enter free agency, you may as well yeah. get something for them. Same with Aerosmith. Um, mm -hmm. We terminated the contract, and um, they ended up, I think, delivering one more album. We made the Sony deal. Yeah.